Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Welcome morning. to Kale Steiner's virtual open day. Thank you all for joining us on Zoom and Facebook Live this lovely Sunday morning. I can see the sky out my window. Um, I'm Leanne and I'll be your host this morning. Uh, before we start, I'd like to draw your attention to the plan for today. If you have a look on the slide, you'll see that after my introduction, there'll be a short video of our school now and in the future. Then there's the main event, which is teacher Jessica's sharing, and then we'll end with a Q&A session. Um, I'd like to mention now, if you can have a look in your chat, the link in the chat is for your questions. If at any time during the presentation today you have a question, please post it via this link. You will be able to see all the questions. And if your question has already been asked, please simply like that same question using the thumbs up icon, which you can see there in the corner. The more likes a question has, the further up the list it goes, which means that it will be tackled first. But we will do our best to answer all questions today. Thank you. So, here we are together, virtually. Um, while nothing can beat a physical open day where you can walk around and see and feel our school in the forest, smell and breathe in our cool, fresh air, we can at least explain and show you to the best of our ability what we're about and what we aim to do for all the children who join us and how we do this. Our school has the great fortune and privilege of being in KL and yet set in a forest which is Penchala Hills. I'm sorry, I was muted. Shall we start again? So good morning, everybody. Okay, you were just muted for the last 10 seconds. Oh, for the last 10 seconds. Okay, so um, I was talking to you about the physical, the physical presence at our school and how lovely that would have been. But in the absence of that, we will do our best to show you our school and what we do and how we do this. So um, I don't know if you heard where we are, but we are in KL and set in a forest, which is Penchala Hills. We're 10 minutes away from Modkiara, Tropicana, Desa Park City, and Damansara Heights. We are that very rare thing, a forest school in city center. So I'd like to give you a very brief idea of how we came about. This school was set up by three parents, three parents who passionately wanted something for their children that the current education system couldn't provide. They wanted their children to grow up whole, balanced, knowledgeable, multi-skilled, and connected to themselves and the world around them. And they wanted them to be free, free to be who they really are, and free to become who they are meant to be. So, an impassioned and courageous step was taken and the school opened in January 2019. We are, right now, a kindergarten and primary school with plans to expand and embrace a secondary school within five years. Now, before we move on to the meat of the session, which is teacher Jessica's sharing, I wanted to bring something up for you to ponder. We all know this, education is important, there is no doubt. But I'd like you to consider something today. What is the purpose of education? What is it meant to do for us? Is it to meet society's needs? Does it? You see, we've basically been on this one educational train track that's been laid out for us since the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. And it's kind of been like this for so long that we've forgotten to adapt to changes in the situation in any meaningful way. The Industrial Revolution saw a shift of economic focus from agriculture to manufacturing, 
which meant at that time they needed people to work in factories with division of labor and specialization. When the Industrial Revolution took hold, education changed to serve the needs of the time. That meant that at that time, education moved into the classroom where children were taught to, yeah, specialize. But forward to today, we are on the cusp of some societal transformation. We are moving away from a predominantly manufacturing economy into quite a different era. So our needs have changed. And my question is, if education is to continue to serve our purpose, then does it not also need to change? Perhaps what we need now is to be less specialized, meaning being very good at one thing and more multidisciplinary, meaning being able to master several skills at once. The future is uncertain, as it always is. But the way things are going and the rate we're going at, it's perhaps even more uncertain. We need to prepare our future generations, our children. And you will discover shortly that Kale Steiner's aims are to serve current needs and to prepare for the future, whatever that holds. Thank you for giving me your time. Now I'd like to invite teacher Jessica, a teacher with our school since we started and is our current grade two and movement teacher. And she will show you how Kale Steiner aims to help your child meet the future. Jessica? Thank you, Leanne. Good morning, dear parents and friends. Thank you for being here today. Human beings are going faster and faster, and it seems like we are heading towards space industrialization. Have you been keeping up the recent news? Billionaires like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and Richard Branson, they have been building rockets and going up into space. Oh, the one of the of being in space is how astronauts do their very human business up there when there's no gravity. Oh, everything is floating. Yes, this is a big problem. Of course, they have some solution to it, but it's really expensive. Um, last year, this problem was solved by a nine-year-old Malaysian boy from Klang. Jason Kang won um, an international NASA's competition by inventing the space suit Luna toilet, a personal and portable toilet which allows them to do their business in private. <laughs> and how did he do this? In an interview, the science coach said that he was just an ordinary boy who loves space very, very, very much. His passion, his resilience, got him to where he is now, and of course, the support and love he got from his surroundings. It is amazing where passion can lead you to lead you. Bearing this in mind, I'd like to invite you to do a little exercise with me. I would like to invite you to write one word in the chat room to describe what qualities you want your child to have when they, have, when they leave school at 21. I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about it. Resourceful. There is um, resourceful, flexible, flexible, flexible. Ooh, many coming in. Creative, Creative. compassionate, Creative. agile. Responsible, wholesome, independent, 
passionate. You're going to have to write faster, Jessica. Passionate. Confident. Understanding, it's understanding him or herself well. So maybe you can just put uh, connected, maybe connected. That might be easier. Kind, happy, healthy, have grit. Grit. Yeah, grit. Maybe that's kind of like uh, resilient, perhaps. Be accountable. Healthy, mentally and physically, we can just put healthy. Um, understand the life purpose. Critical thinking. So to be a critical, it's a good thing Jessica is a teacher and she's used to writing on a blackboard, eh? <laughs> Um, honest, okay, and a leader. Right, that's probably all, all the space we have. It's great. Thank you, parents, for the ideas. Now, I would like to share with you how our school proposes to help nurture these attributes in your children. Previous. Learning is... Previous slide, please. Yeah. Learning is experience, everything else is just information. What Einstein is saying, is saying here is that experience is really important in the learning process. So at our school, all our children learn through experience. And I'll show you how this helps them to be passionate, independent and lifelong learners. And when you sit down and observe children, you can see that they are born eager to learn and they are very curious by nature. nature. Everything is a wonder to them, especially in their early years. The first time they tasted sour lemon or spicy chili. And when they, when, when they go to our school, we continue to stimulate that curiosity by giving them the environment to feel secure. And teachers will lead them to experience interesting things around the forest. And that makes them wonder in amazement. And sometimes you can see the joy in their eyes when they see a spinning flower in school, like falling in front of them, for example. It's really very nice to see that. And when teachers stimulate the child's senses, it connects with them. And this forms a relationship with the child. For example, when we teach maths in grade one, we start off with asking the students, what qualities each number represents? what exists as one in our surrounding. So parents, any ideas? Or, um, yeah. So yeah, some will say it's <laughs> one sun. There's one sun. My students will say, oh yes, one ocean. Yeah, <laughs> one ocean, one moon, one me, that kind of idea. Like, yeah. So we guide um, the children to explore what numbers mean in our world. And as you can see, the child is forming a real connection with maths instead of just pure abstract maths. And then we go on to visualizing numbers by introducing them Roman numerals. And why? It's because they can form a type of connection with their own fingers. One, Roman numeral one, two, three, four, five, a V. Six, that's how it comes about. So they can connect to it and this makes sense to them especially in grade one. In introducing Arabic numbers and alphabets, we kind of do it this way, where, as you can see, I'll tell them a story about um, a story that has a mountain. When introducing N, I'll tell them a story that, we, that involves mountain, and then we draw a mountain. And then from there, They get to outline what air is. Instead of just abstract air. Same goes for numbers as well. That's how we learn. And if you notice, 
we do it in this way, which is in pictorial images. Because this can actually help nurture their imagination and flexible thinking. So, what is learning? Well, we believe that students are really learning when they are able to express what they have learned in their own ways. So most of the time, I will ask the children to express which part of the story I've just told resonates with them most through drawing or writing. And from discovering numbers in their first years to discovering algebra, science, history in their later years, students actually take part in their learning process by creating their own textbooks like this. This is the cover of it is actually I think I'm going to sorry. Yeah. Here you go. This is um, um, one of my students' work. You can see this is our number. I'll tell them a story about Number Island. This is their painting. And then to draw out the picture, their most memorable story, part from the story of the story. And they'll draw out one sun, one moon, and they do two eyes, three triangles, and so on. So this is a sample of our um, number, uh, number maths lesson. So the stories, yes, it contains stories, essays, poems, illustrations, lab descriptions, maths equations, all sorts of learning. And this is, um, this is for them to have a direct um, experience with their learning. So real learning is also taking place outside classrooms. And every now and then, students go to a restaurant warong in the village on a class trip to practice their language and when they order food and use maths in calculating how much they need to pay for their food. This will actually help build their self-learning capacity as they grow to be an adult. Okay. So how is experiential learning conducted in our school? Maria Montessori once said, play is the work of the child. So in our school, we have four types of play um, four types of playful learning. Yeah, we have free play, we have guided play, we have um, rules, uh, games with rules and direct instruction. And all this work on stimulating their senses. And so how is playing going to help children develop their passion and independence? Well, the Smithsonian Institution in America hosted a conference to explore the role of play in the inventive process of some of the most well-known inventors, such as the uh, inventors, scientists, and artists. And one of them was Alexander Fleming, the scientist who discovered penicillin. And it all started when he drew colored pictures in his Petri dish. So he was so happy and excited by a blue mole that he kept drawing it. And that's how he later discovered antibiotics. And now studies have proven that play helps to engage children emotionally, mentally, and actively. And when they play, they are developing their social skills as well. If you have a chance to observe how children play, you'll be amazed how much concentration they are using. It's very serious for them. Everything is real in front of them at that point. And you can see how much imagination they are creating in their mind. And when they face problems, they start coming with all sorts of funny and interesting solutions. They try, they fail, they try, and, and yeah. And I can see that all these ways, they are actually helping them themselves in some ways to develop creativity and flexible thinking. So in our school, we also um, recognize the ability of human beings unconscious learning through imitation. Um, sure, no, this is nothing new to us. For example, when we were babies, we don't learn walking or speaking from instructions. We learn from imitating the adults around us. And perhaps some of you might even have heard the story about the wolf boy who was raised by um, animals and lived isolated from human contacts for many years at, since of, at, from a very young age. He had trouble walking upright and even speaking human language at the later stage. His young children imitate far more than we imagine. So please be careful when you're in front of them because the impressions that they take in and mimic becomes behaviors that will stick with them for the rest of their life. 
So in our school, we make sure that meaningful and purposeful activity is done consciously in the presence of young children. We also focus a lot on the development of our senses, of senses in our school, even more so during the early years, because a healthy functioning of senses is everything to learning. Teachers have to carefully design lessons which allow constant and subtle stimulation of the senses to take place. For example, during kindergarten free play, when a children touches cloth, when a child touches cloth with of different materials such as um, cotton and linen and silk on your skin, the feeling of it, or like wooden toys and furniture, or even the smell of the beeswax. Yes, all these experiences build a kind of library, a library of understanding and knowledge in them that they can access throughout their whole life. Yeah, so as you can see, experience, uh, learning is an experiential activity. You experience it. So we really need to introduce children to the right experience um, each, to introduce children to each experience at the right time in their development. Yes, this is to make sure that students truly have a connection with the subject and they can understand what is being taught instead of just memorizing abstract facts. It could be unhealthy for them when they are just forced to memorize too many things all the time. In our develop in, in, and in developing our lesson content, we focus on what is practical for students at this age. Like, what do they need in life now? From there, they learn to need their own flute holder. This is in grade one. And they grow food in grade three. And then they make their own um, crayon holder in grade five, when they have learned um, stitching skills from grade one and uh, up to grade five, they consolidate their skills and so on. We have a lot of these kind of things here. All around, they taught their own toys, their own stationery, um, uh, keeper, yes. So when they keep, um, when they complete their work, you can actually see the kind of joy and satisfaction in their eyes. Like when they're using it, they feel so proud about it. Oh, this guy made this look, you know, and, and whenever they make something new, they'll be like showing to me like, oh, and then they will start bringing it and taking care of it really nicely in the class. And this actually forms a connection to learning. Well, it might not be obvious, but they're actually learning maths, science and language at that time. They need to count, they need to measure, they need to weigh. In both farming and eating and most of all this experiential learning, it involves all this. They need to record their experience through their writing and their drawing while they are learning new vocabularies. So this is how learning happens through experience. Thank you. So education, as you can see, Einstein once said, education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. So how do we do this? Like here we have critical thinking, understanding, being independent. As you know, we want our children to be problem solvers and critical thinkers to solve issues like health pandemics, climate change, poverty, etc., and so on. Being knowledgeable in one field is no longer enough, like what Lian said just this, uh, in our introduction. The up and coming generation needs to be well equipped with knowledge from different subjects to have critical minds and collaborative spirits. And how do we nurture this in our school? So in kindergarten, we start with working on their fine and gross motor skills. So activities such as kneading bread for their lunch, and, this study, and by doing these activities, studies have shown that it helps connect the synapses in your brain and at the same time, encouraging new brain cell growth, especially during the first seven years of the child. That's why we don't do reading and writing at this age because their brains are actually not ready for it. Still, they still need all these movements to make sure that cells are, new cells are created and the synapses are, are, joy, are, are connecting up there. So we provide them the environment to work on their imagination through toys like this. It can be a donut, it can be coins. I can, I've seen them using this being all sorts of things. Their imagination is really wonderful. 
and also through stories throughout their whole school journey. So, yeah, please let, give, uh, let me share with you a part of the um, story that I will tell my students. Once upon a time, there was a mummy bird with a little yellow baby bird. They lived in a basket-shaped nest woven by twigs and leaves and softened with feathers. Their cozy home was on top of a branch of a very tall Maranti tree and they, so they were surrounded with colourful, fragrant, fragrant frangipani penny flowers and they live happily together. So, how did you feel when I was telling the story? I wonder if you see the picture in your head when I was describing the scene. Well, my, my students, they find it very, very easy to do this. When I tell a story, I'm actually guiding them to develop imagination even more when I stimulate their senses with colours and smell and so on. Yes, relaxing. <laughs> Thank you, Maya. Yes. <laughs> so, in this way, children will... Why do we do so actually? Yeah. You might wonder, like, <laughs> why don't we just tell the story straight? Actually, in this way, we have the chance... We'll give the chance, the um, children, to use their brain to imagine the story in their mind. Just like how we need to keep our body healthy through physical exercise, children actually need to train their mind through such mental exercise because this is the foundation for critical thinking. And that is why we encourage storytelling instead of watching um, TV or cartoons. Because when you watch something on the screen, their brain is actually merely passively absorbing information in. It's not doing any exercise, it's just taking it in. So they don't really need to think. And over time, if they have been exercising their brain, actually they can really end up to be an adult who is capable of thinking for themselves, solving problems and thinking critically. Something that is pretty much like in a society right now, it seems. So in upper primary, science teaching is actually based on observation and Socratic inquiry. Yes, for example, how do we do that? When we work with an experiment, the first day, I'll show something to spark their curiosity. So the students will just be quiet, observing it like, whoa, what's that? The light's coming out. How did the light come out? And all sorts of things. They'll be like wondering there. And the second day, um, after that, we'll just clean up. We don't talk about it. And the second day, we'll talk about it in class. And using their memory, they try to remember what happened and then we draw it out. And on the third day, we discuss and consolidate their learning. So by doing it in this way, we are actually encouraging them to find the answers for themselves and to think critically. Um, yeah, in our, in our school, we do arts as much as, sorry, the previous, yeah. In our school, we do, uh, do arts uh, as much as science. Like Einstein once said, the greatest scientists are artists as well. Imagination is more important than knowledge. So like, unlike STEM, like what's going on in Malaysia, we have STEAM, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which includes art as well. So we incorporate art into all our teaching, mainly to nourish children's imagination to deepen their empathy so that they can develop this kindness in them and also to help them develop a freedom I just use only yeah. and also help them to develop a freedom in thinking so to that we have lessons that combine several learning areas for example when children when kindergarten in chil uh, kindergarten children bake they are using their motor skills their sense of smell their sense of sight while learning about way to how much for each one of us, or how much bread for each one of us. So, 
yes, as you can see, in order to find a solution to a problem and to think outside the box, you need to be imaginative. And as you can see, studies have been showing, proving, pr proven um, all the time that imagination comes from the artistic side of the brain. So that's why it's very important for us not to just separate science and art. And in fact, we, sh we have to integrate it. And nowadays, more and more, uh, more, and more um, education, they are realizing this, in, including Malaysia, I think. Last year, um, the government was proposing to, have integrate, uh, to integrate arts into it. Um, next slide. Thank you. I just want to show you how many different things we teach here. <laughs> yeah, I know. It looks a, a lot, doesn't it? It's like all the way from grade 1 to grade 12. So this is so children can experience a wide range of knowledge and skills and also to build their abilities and help them discover their passion. Because if they don't experience this at a young age, they don't know what is it that really stimulates their feeling, what is it that they're actually more um, um, sensitive to and, and that's how they find out what they love in the future. So as you can see, we have a wide variety of subjects available in our curriculum. We have from farming, to building, to astronomy, to science, trigonometry, geometry, ecology, woodwork, ancient civilizations, drama, geology, basket work, and so forth. Our greatest glory is not in never failing, but in rising every time we fall. A question to ponder. Why do we need to fall and what happens when we fall? Well, in our school, we believe that in order for resilience to develop, we need to go through a process of falling and rising again. Just like when you watch a baby learning to stand, you can see how they would fall and then they pull themselves up again and over up and down over and over and over again this my dear parents and friends is resilience thomas edison once said i have failed ten thousand times but i have successfully found ten thousand ways that will help that will not work perhaps you can recall a period of time when you experienced a fall and how it helped you to be a stronger person I think we all agree that we want our children to be discerning, resilient, and self-confident. And at school, in order to help them get there, these are the sort of things we do. So to truly understand something, failing is part of the learning process, as you can see. And in our school, we provide a safe space for students to experiment life. When they fall or make mistakes, which will happen, we have some guidelines in handling such situation. So how do we do it? For centuries, in all cultures around the world, stories have been used to instruct children on ethical and moral issues and to educate their character. And when stories are being told, children tend to be engaged completely I remember one of my students, when I was talking, telling him about this old man with a long white beard, I could see his face and his eyes looking at me, imagining that there was this white beard with him as well. Yes, and that's why we use stories to touch and instruct them on their deepest level. Different grades have their own story theme, depending on their needs, because stories guide them to explore right and wrong inwardly and outwardly because this helps develop a sense of discernment in them gradually and i believe this is not just applicable to children adults as well they are very receptive to stories too so in our school there is no such thing as naughty children because for us they're actually just exploring and they're just being curious and they are definitely not doing it on purpose to annoy us. They never want to, especially if they form a really strong connection with you, because they want you to see them as, ah, I'm, but unless, of course, unless they're trying to tell you something indirectly. Well, that's another topic, <laughs> yes. So we allow them to make mistakes and we let them know that there's no shame in doing so. And stories will guide them to what action is right and wrong without finger pointing. 
Especially when the mistake is done that is not really affecting others too much at that point of time, we try not to work on it at that point in front of everyone. We'll bring this, I'll, I'll observe the situation, bring it to my class, prepare a story, and next day we'll talk about it. And, and actually the students know. They know it by heart who I'm talking about, what I'm talking about, but it's just all inwardly. And then you see some changes outwardly as well. So we respect their dignity, but of course, besides so, um, stories, for example, when something really goes out of balance that it's affecting others immediately at that point and it's causing some problems. So we'll do, we'll do something. For example, um, a, few years ago, a few years ago when my eight-year-old student threw coconut husk into the neighbor's backyard, <laughs> instead of scolding or punishing him with something unrelated like, hey, you, boy, pull, your, pull your ears, stop it, pull your ears. I'll just look at him. I, I won't do that, of course, and I'll ask him, how would it feel? Oh dear, how would it feel if someone threw that into your backyard? I'll ask him. And then he'll just look at me. Then we'll talk a little bit about how upset mommy would be because they would be living with rats and cockroaches. And then, we, and then we talk about fixing this situation. Usually I'll ask him like, so what do you think we can do? And, they, and this, this little boy was like, okay, let's, let's take the broom and then we'll go to the neighbors. I didn't even have to tell him, apologize to the neighbor. I told him a little story of, oh, the cockroaches and it's <laughs> coming all into the house and all. And, 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 and slowly he could form that image in his mind. And then he thought, okay, we got to sort this out. <laughs> yeah, we, I, 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 yeah, so by doing it in this way, um, <clears throat> yeah. I, well, you, if you see, what I did was to show him the consequences of his actions and how to fix the situation. So every time when something happens, we always relate whatever the so-called, some people will claim that they need to be punished, but we don't really punish them. We'll just guide them to see the consequences of their actions and how we're going to fix it. Because what their actions have done was it affected others, um, it affected others negatively. Just like how if someone else does it to them, it will affect them negatively too. So if they're feeling this as well, especially young children, they can feel it really um, deeply. <laughs> yes. But, um, so by doing it this way, the child is actually learning discernment, what was right and wrong, without shaming them, and which in turn builds self-confidence. So by allowing them to explore and make mistakes and rectifying them over and over again, in a non-judging environment, they can actually build self-confidence and resilience. So, yes, we also want our children to be accomplished, global, and engaged. And our wide-range connected curriculum, as you can see just now, helps students to see and appreciate connections with their surrounding and the world. The connected curriculum also allows them to be knowledgeable about many different things and they start off by understanding themselves and how they are related to the world and this helps develop their empathy, kindness, that's how our kindness comes about. And this is also how they become engaged human beings. Because our lessons are multicultural, firstly students study the history and geography of their own surrounding first outside their house and then on their way to school. And then we'll ask them, do you remember? How do you get from your school? And you know, if it's, yeah, yeah. And then they start, and then they go, they move on to the state and to the country, and then to the neighboring countries, and finally to the other parts of the world. So this is where they get to see the similarities and the differences between them and the outside world. So we look at history, we look at peoples, we look at religions, we look at politics of the world, and these include Islamic civilization, ancient Greek, ancient, ancient Greek civilization, or ancient China civilization, and so on. This is just to name a few. And from here, students build a solid foundation of their own culture and of others. The culture of indigenous people as well in our, in our lessons is really very important. Students will go and visit um, indigenous uh, village, villages because that is where we, we, ca we came from in the past. So they have a connection with how mankind started at the beginning and then they slowly move on towards um, later civilization. And in this way, they gradually 
become aware and engage in their world and this inspires them to act and become competent to lead. Excellent. So, today, okay, thank you. Today we have global health issues such as the COVID pandemic going on right now. And if you're unhealthy with weak immune system, you're actually at risk. So yes, hopefully this will end soon and I wish everyone safe, everyone and your family safe at this stage. So this leads us to questions like, how can period of schooling be used to give our students maximum healing and strengthening forces? And how can protecting children's mental and emotional development receive just as much attention as promoting their intelligence and their physical skills? So in our school, we are well aware of the problems of the world and we want to be able to give our students an environment where they can be healthy, whole and happy, like the screen them. Okay, so parents, we've been sitting here listening to me for about 20, uh, 25 minutes and yeah, so you're probably getting a little restless. I would like to invite you to join me in this little game that I play with my students. And now, um, I'd like to invite you to stand up. <coughs> and now we'll stand tall like a tree. Thank you. Yeah. So how do you feel now? Better? More weak? <laughs> yes. Um, thank you for joining me in this little um, demonstration. Yes, well, actually, this is an example of what we do in our classroom. In our timetable, we make sure that everything is balanced. Um, before the exercise, you have been sitting still and concentrating for a while. Perhaps some of, you, some of you might be feeling a bit restless. And so we had a bit of movement and that's balance. As you can see, if the child have been moving, has been moving around a lot, then they need to rest for a bit. And if they concentrate too much, they need to relax for a bit. Just like, yeah. So this, this polarity here, it's a little bit like a feeling, it's, 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 it's like a feeling of expansion. So when you open up your arms wide and you can feel how it feels like you're breathing, how your breathing flows in, it feels deeper as opposed to contraction when you close up your hands and you can feel how you breathe, it's, yeah, it's more shallow when you open up and close. It's, this is the same feeling we try to give the child, you know, um, yeah, to balance their experience, making sure that um, both sides, whenever too much of one thing, when they want too much of long, deep breath, we give them a little bit of coming down in, and in this way, they are more inward. inward. So this is how we balance our experience, and um, studies have shown that our physical and emotional well-being depends a lot on it. So parents at home, perhaps you can bring in, uh, bring into mind, like you know, uh, when you have you have been doing some activities that are, yeah, too mo that needs too much rest, uh, that needs too much movement. Perhaps calm down for a bit with the child, and you can see a difference if you are doing this with your children. You can see how they are, yeah, they are more calm and they are more relaxed, and they don't tend to give you more problems like you know, <laughs> finding problems out in it, yeah, so-called for your, yeah. So here, we also need to balance their thinking 
their feeling and their actions is in order to be healthy, whole and happy. So we create our timetable so that there is time for all this to take place where your head is activated and later your feelings are activated, stimulated and then your hands and your legs are all working. So this is something that they experience taking place daily, weekly, monthly and yearly. And through repetition, the rhythm soon becomes healthy habits. And studies have shown that con the continuity, such continuity actually brings a sense of security and that is needed for learning. And it also influences our body's ability to recover from illnesses. And this helps them to be happy, whole and healthy. Here, our physical education, we call it games and movement in the lower grades. It involves storytelling and character play. Remember how serious they can get with playing? This is, this is when they run, they will wholeheartedly run with all their might. After telling them a story about giant and some children, yeah, they will run with all their might to escape from the giant, which is me, chasing after them. And they had so much fun. No force is needed at all, parents. Yeah, they are just working on their whole body and running and all sorts of activities we have like jumping, everything to work on their fine and gross motor skills. So here, besides working on, our, on their physical development, it also helps build their social skills and their inner strength. Because our willpower to do something can actually be trained through consistent physical activities. Yeah, you can experiment, it, uh, experiment that yourself. Remember what I said earlier? Physical activity is very important in creating learning pathways in your brain. So, mental and emotional health is so crucial, especially in today's world. Because research shows that childhood trauma stays with you for life. And it can lead to anxiety, depression, just to name a few. And that is why we handle mistakes carefully and we try to give children a stress-free environment so they can be mentally and emotionally healthy. Let me give you a few examples. The first thing we do is we try to understand each child. Ideally, teachers will stay and grow together with the same group of students from the first year up to eight years, the year eight. So this actually helps us to connect, like to really connect with our students so we can better understand each individual, in each individual child after observing and assessing them for eight years. It also helps children develop a form of trust and love for their teachers. And this gives them a sense of security, knowing that there's somebody there for them as well as their parents. And when children hang out with the same classmates for eight years, they grow together, they play, they laugh, they argue, then they ignore, and then they forgive and they accept and they empathize. All these feelings and emotions taking place in, in this little, little classroom here. And all this learning takes time and consistency. And secondly, par uh, secondly, our parents are very much involved in our school's activities if, um, whenever possible, such as festive celebrations and even building and improving the school environment. So everybody gets involved. We are a real community here. And thirdly, when children, gets ups when children get upset over something, instead of suppressing it, letting them suppress it, which it has been known that it is unhealthy. We allow them to express themselves in all sorts of artistic and physical ways because these are actually a form of therapy. In addition, in treating depression, doctors would actually prescribe art, music and all craft therapy to their patients as it has been proven that when we are doing all these activities, our brain releases a kind of serotonin it's actually a natural antidepressant. So we have all these activities included, integrated into our lessons. Every, um, every, it's either in a daily, weekly or a monthly rhythm. 
Research also suggests that eating a healthy and nutritious diet can improve mental health, can enhance your cognitive skills like concentration and memory, and it can also improve academic performance. With this in mind, at school, we provide organic, vegetarian and balanced food. And it's, and it's very yummy as well. We have a really nice and good chef. chef. Yes. Well, we spend quite a lot of time showing you how we create, that, um, create an environment that helps nurture these attributes in your child. And I'm sure some of you are wondering how we managed to teach in this way during lockdown. I would like to take another five minutes of your time, if I may, to share with you how we have been teaching online. In our school, we call our, our, our online learning the Distance Support Learning Program. Well, our students don't just sit in front of the screen and listen to their teachers speak for hours. During lessons, we'll ask them questions, play games that are related to their teaching and their environment, to their learning and their environment as well, so their surrounding at home. So they are connecting with school life while actively participating with real things around them instead of just passively absorb, absorbing information from the screen or, or looking at a, book, a textbook and the teacher's voice and, 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 and stuff like this. It's, it's very different here. So as you can see in our um, timetable here, the one on the left is our kindergarten timetable. So the orange indicates an online session and the pink is where parents can choose if they want to join the lesson on or offline. It's very activity-based, such as you can see activities like preparing food, baking, painting, craft work. And we guide parents to do these activities together with their kids. Being aware that there are dangers of too much, that being aware of the dangers of too much screen time, we actually limit our screen time as much as possible. As you can see in our primary school's timetable, grade four, you can see they move from online which is orange, to offline, which is green, throughout the learning day. The offline time to consolidate their learning and complete their tasks given. And while they are using their minds in the morning, like what we mentioned, the head, heart and hand, you can see that they have time in the later part to express themselves artistically with languages, with um, songs and music. And at the later part of the day to express themselves physically, to be physically active. That's when we have dance lesson, gardening, movement, handwork, and so on. So, yes. Yes, this, so this has been an introduction on the way, to the way we teach when we are at school and also when we are online. And I hope you find it interesting. So, yeah, before we wrap up and move on, to the Q&A session, I would like to invite you once more to close your eyes and picture your child at 21, see it, feel it, just give yourselves a minute. Thank you. Please open your eyes and have a look at this slide. <laughs> Is this something you might have imagined? A politician who truly cares about people and environment and social justice. An ethical entrepreneur who cares about people and social equality. Or a software engineer who prioritizes humanity. 
or a farmer who applies the latest drone technology. Someone who is passionate, multi-skilled and masterful in more than one area. This is certainly how we imagine our graduates to be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. A wonderful sharing. So thank you everyone for spending your entire Sunday morning with us. Um, I hope you'll go away with some useful information about the school, Kale Steiner, and uh, that you've gained an insight into how we teach, how we nurture, and actually it's really about how we help to bring out the already existing passionate and masterful human being that your children actually are. Um, okay, here I'd like to give you a reminder for further inquiries. If you can have a look at the slide, uh, you can contact Kian here. Um, there's a, a telephone number, you can send him a WhatsApp, you can email him, or you can use the QR code and that will take you to our, F, uh, our Facebook page. Right, that's it for today. Thank you again, everybody.